keyboards. Where would we be without all those keys, numbers, graphical symbols, basic commands? I, for one, do not know. Because like it or lump it, we've had keyboards and their descendants for a long time, and as input devices go, they seem to do the job pretty well. But some keyboards just do the job better, don't they? And this was particularly true whilst the home micro was emerging, cost cutting was paramount and frankly, where in the absence of knowing better, we just liked it or lumped it. In this crazy modern age, I hear people complain about not having cherry switches on their keyboards. I've even had comments blasting me for not using a mechanical keyboard in day to day use. Well, let me just say this, if you've grown up using a ZX Spectrum keyboard, then a polished brick feels like a damn luxury. And as long as I can type without breaking my fingers or hitting the wrong keys, then I am as happy as a pig in the filthiest of sh**. But that being said, the keyboard was our main connection to this wonderful and fascinating digital world. And for me, the look and feel of the keyboards I've used over the years is a strong nostalgic memory. From the raised keys of the spongy yet clunky Commodore 64, to the marshmallow-like bounce found in the Atari ST, and even the clackety yet responsive half keyboard of the Amiga 600. But it's easy to place these blissful memories aside and take a subjective view of how poor some of these data entry devices really were, and many just felt like an afterthought. So here then, from a general usability point of view, are the worst 5 keyboards I've used in my life. Number 5. The ZX Spectrum Plus Amstrad ha creado... During 1984, a lot of things were happening with the home micro scene. Amstrad launched their CPC, Commodore were gaining traction with their 64, and many companies were falling by the wayside. With this in mind, Sinclair thought it was time to revitalise their Spectrum model by gifting it with a real keyboard. This was the result. On the outset it seems pretty nice. Each key has a finger shaped moulding, everything is laid out clearly and there's even a reasonable travel distance on key press. Underneath the plastic keys is a rubber switch mat, which then depresses onto a membrane, all held in place with a metal backplate. It was a quick, cheap and cheerful solution for improving the existing Spectrum keyboard. And an improvement it indeed was, but I have a few gripes. First, the keys are very close together, making touch typing a touch difficult. Second, the keyboard itself is raised considerably off the ground and there's no wrist support. Given that the electronics are stored below, it's part of the parcel, but even with the support legs extended, it makes for some tiresome typing. Third, the keyboard is just so flat. It's hard to press a key without pressing any other keys at the same time, and this is especially true if you have fat fingers. The keys themselves require reasonable pressure, and once this pressure is met, they give instantly, popping back up like a character from those arcade bashing machines. If you're using 48k basic, then the built-in key commands do take some of the typing chore out of proceedings, but this is a learning curve in itself, and I have only admiration for those who used one of these models to code in a professional sense. Number 4, the ZX Spectrum. This might seem like I'm picking on Sinclair, but regardless of how much I love Sinclair machines, it's a sad reality that their keyboards, although somewhat innovative, were an upsetting misery to use for any extended period of time. The original Spectrum's keyboard used the same principle as the Plus, just without the plastic keys on top. Instead, we have rubber keys which make contact directly with the keyboard membrane underneath, making for a somewhat squishy experience. If you've ever used a crappy digital telephone, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Typing on a Spectrum keyboard is a bizarre experience. You feel like you're using a data entry point for a door, some kind of electronic product you just tap a few buttons on and leave. But no, if you're programming on this thing, then you're in for a long and distressing time. Apart from the obvious rubber key situation, there's also the issue of accessibility. Half the keys, including the directional arrows, are tucked away under other keys, requiring combinations of cap shift and symbol shift to access them. 
And if you want to use the spacebar, you either have to grow an extra thumb on your right hand, become amazingly adept with your little finger, or just move your entire hand. We know why Sinclair did this, we know Rick Dickinson's design looks beautiful in its construction, but flipping heck, it is a pain to use. Number 3. The ZX80 slash ZX81. And so we peel back yet another layer on the Sinclair machines. This time the rubber layer disappears altogether, allowing the user to type directly onto the keyboard membrane, perhaps allowing them to feel more at one with their digital device. No. This very basic method introduces the least responsive tactile experience you're ever likely to have with a computer. Jesus, it's like trying to read braille through a pair of gardening gloves. The layout is fairly similar to the Spectrum, but at least you have something squishy to squish with the Spectrum, with this it's just like pressing on a desk. The only way you really know if you've been successful with your press is the corresponding output on the flickering television. Sinclair did manage to produce a home micro for an unbelievably low price at the time, and unfortunately this keyboard was just one sacrifice to make it all possible. Still, we didn't care at the time one bit. We had a freaking computer man. Not a computer man, I mean a computer man. Yeah. Number 2. It's alright, Sinclair, you are in the clear because we have the Philips Video Pack G7000. Known in North America as the Magnavox Odyssey 2 or Magnavox Odyssey Squared, this is really a console more than a computer, but it does have a keyboard and you can indeed run BASIC on it. So in that sense, it makes perfect sense to include it here. Released in 1978, this machine actually arrived before the ZX80, and for the most part you could just use the joysticks to play games. But when you did come to use the keyboard, you damn well wished you hadn't. We had the same tactile issues as the ZX81 and 80, but this time the keys are less responsive. They're narrow and they're just laid out in an unpleasing fashion. I mean, at least we have a spacebar at the bottom, but you're more likely to press it with your fingers than your thumbs. The layout just oozes unfriendliness for normal typing, and the fact that the unit is quite high off the ground just rubs salt into those bitter, bitter wounds. It's also indented into the case, which just makes for an uncomfortable experience, and a well-deserved second place on this list. So, number one is, rather fittingly, the Oric One. Released in 1983, the Oric One is in many ways much like the ZX Spectrum. It's small, it's got 48k of RAM, it's got BASIC, and it has a very strange keyboard. Now, on first glance, you might think that actually this keyboard isn't too bad. It's got realistic plastic keys, it even has a spacebar front and middle, just like all good keyboard layouts should have. But Christ on a bicycle, it's like someone has taken a bunch of Tic Tacs, glued them to the ZX Spectrum's rubber keys, and then gone, alrighty then, job done. It's disgusting to use. Not only are the keys small, knobbly, and hard to hit, they feel like they're balancing on a bowl of jelly. Now don't get me wrong, I like the Oric One, and I can see how they were trying to get one over on the Spectrum with harder keys, more like a proper computer, but it just doesn't work, and it's by far the worst keyboard I have personally used in my life. Now, there are plenty of other atrocious keyboards about, some I haven't had the pleasure of using, but you can just tell by looking at them that they're... Oh, oh God. So if you have any unpleasant keyboard experiences, I don't mean you've spilt something horrific on them, please share them with me in the comments, and we can all tend to our calloused fingers. I also want to point out that I find these keyboards part of the charm of these old computers, and I wouldn't change them for the world. They're part of the nostalgia, they're part of what made them cheap, they are part of history, and for that reason, they are all perfect. Anyway, thanks for watching, stay tuned for more keyboard babbles, but most of all, have yourself a great evening. See ya!